Welcome back, everyone. This is Dave from Corn Productions here to talk about Star Trek Picard Season 3, Episode 1, titled The Next Generation, the season premiere of the final season of this series. The episode's description reads as follows After receiving a distress call from Beverly Crusher, John Luke Picard enlists help from generations old and new for one last adventure, a mission that will change Starfleet and his old crew forever. The episode was directed by Douglas Aronofsky, who did five other episodes of this series, and written by Terry Metalis, who serves as showrunner for this season. Before going any further, I'll tell you a couple of things. One, this is not a spoiler-free video, so if you haven't watched the episode, I highly recommend you go and check it out, and then come back and watch my video. Secondly, if you like this video and want to support this channel, please like, share, and comment, as well as subscribing to my channel. Now, I haven't reviewed this series too much on my channel. I did the first season episode, Remembrance, which was the series premiere of this series. And then I did two other episodes of season two. The first season was okay. Uh, I liked a lot of it, though I didn't really like how it ended, turning John Luke Picard into an android at the end. Season two had a lot of promise going into it. The return of Q, played by John Delancey. But it eventually became clear that they were trying to tell a what amounted to a three-episode story and stretch it out into ten episodes. Thus, a lot of the season was marking time and stalling. John Delancey as Q was a delight as always, but there were a lot of problems with the season. For instance, these scenes would start with uh, with John Luke Picard's childhood felt a little weird. Something it felt like it was talking about John Luke as if he were from the 19th century his childhood having occurred in the 1900s, as opposed to in the 23rd, 24th century. And the show's treatment of mental illness was a bit odd, given the fact that, once again, we are in the 25th century, and you would figure that they would know how to handle mental illness better than what was presented during the season. I, I was going to watch this show regardless. I have always been a big fan of Patrick Stewart as John luc Picard. I don't have many heroes, but Patrick Stewart happens to be one of them. So if this show were just Patrick Stewart reading the phone book, I would still pay to watch. Now, season three happens to be a very different season in that they're bringing back the entire cast of Star Trek The Next Generation, which they did not do in the first two seasons. I've seen plenty of reviewers who have gotten advanced copies of season three, the first six episodes, that have said that this is a marked improvement for this series. And this is coming from people who were generally negative about season one and season two. I hope to do all 10 episodes of this series, but we shall see how it goes. I have other commitments and my time does not always allow me to take on multiple series. So for the most part, these videos are going to be shorter than the average video that I do when I talk about a series. Having said that, I enjoyed the first episode a lot, and I think there's a lot of promise here, which I hope continues throughout the season. And if the reviews that I've been re hearing so far are true, then I think we're in for a delightful season. We begin in deep space, and we hear music that sounds like we're beginning an episode of Better Call Saul in space, though there is no sign of Bob Aldernick. We eventually zoom in on what appears to be a starship, which I believe is a medical ship of some kind not connected to the Federation, or Starfleet to be more, to be more specific. We see artifacts in the ship that look very much like the artifacts that Beverly Crusher would have, including very oddly a log entry of Picard narrating the events of Best of Both Worlds. I'm not entirely sure why that is playing. Beverly wakes up to realize that she's about to have a very bad day. Apparently, she and another fellow that we don't quite know yet, the Edward, the Ed Spielers character, who does turn out to be Beverly's son, and I'm hoping also the son of John Luke Picard. Now, granted, that would mean we're repeating beats basically from Star Trek II, but honestly, this entire episode repeats beats from the previous movies, and I don't care. I want this to be John Luke Picard's son so that he could have a legacy going forward. The most depressing thing about his character is the whole notion of him being the last Picard. So I would very much enjoy if they had a son to continue that legacy. Even though John Luke Picard at one point says, 
that he does not need a legacy. He's not a man who needs one. And I'm kind of wondering if that's going to come into play throughout this season. They quickly find themselves under attack by unknown entities. Beverly manages to get a few of them, literally kill a few of them, vaporizing them. But at the same time, she ends up getting shot herself. She manages to fend off the invaders and then go further into hiding away from these creatures. She sends a coded message to John Luc Picard. We cut to Chateau Picard, and Picard is mi- admiring a painting of the old Enterprise D, which was not his first ship, but definitely his favorite. Laris and him are apparently going to some other planet. I'm not sure if they're leaving there permanently or if they're just going there for a visit. But this is a continuation of where we left off with Laris and Picard beginning a relationship. I wasn't sure if that was a relationship that we were going to continue to see in season three or if they were going to completely drop that plot line. Late at night, Picard hears a chirping. Picard eventually digs up his old Enterprise D communicator and wonders exactly how there's a signal being received on that comm. After some digging, he realizes it's a message from Beverly who tells him that she's in trouble and not to trust Starfleet and gives out a coded message that Picard does not understand. And so his plans with Laris need to be put on hold as Picard goes off to save his friend. To do so, he's going to need the help of one of his former officers in Commander William Riker, now Captain William Riker, formerly Captain of the Titan. They meet at Guinan's bar. I'm not sure if it's the same one we saw last season. Guinan herself does not make a reappearance. I don't believe she's in this season at all, at least not from what I've heard. She reprised her role. Whoopi Goldberg reprised her role last season, but I do not believe that she is doing so this season. Apparently, the code that Beverly was giving Picard is not something that he would know because at the time he was Locutus of Borg, and Riker is able to decipher the code and get the exact coordinates of where Beverly is. To get there, however, they're going to need a ship. Picard, unfortunately, is a retired admiral, and I'm not a exactly sure what's going on with Riker. Uh, I guess he's still an active captain, but he doesn't actually have a ship at this time. He's a ship. He's a captain without an actual ship. Apparently, he and Troy are having some difficulties. The exact nature of those difficulties have yet to be revealed. Riker reveals a plan that will involve Starfleet while not actually involving Starfleet, and that is to fake their way on board the Titan as inspectors of the ship where we have the old pomp and circumstance of movies like Star Trek II, where we have the whistle uh, greeting honored guests such as Picard and Riker. They are greeted by Annika Hansen, formerly known as Seven. She's now a commander in Starfleet, though she seems to be uncomfortable with that role. The bridge has a LaForge on it as the pilot. This would be Sidney LaForge, one of Geordi LaForge's kids, played by... Lavar Burton's actual daughter. They meet up with Captain Liam Shaw, who apparently is no fan of the two of them, saying that the inspection should be very boring because there won't be any shootouts or crash landings. Now, if he's talking about Riker's time on the Titan, I could buy that. Hell, if he's even describing the movies, the TNG movies, I could buy that. But he is definitely, most definitely, not talking about TNG. That is not an accurate description of what the next generation was really all about. Picard tries to get him to change course. Riker and him trying to sell a con that this is for that this, that this is somehow sanctioned by Starfleet. But neither one of them actually have any standing with Starfleet at this time. Picard is a retired admiral, and I'm not even really clear as to what Riker's status is. I guess he's a captain and he's an active duty, but he does not currently have a ship. Captain Shaw turns them down. And that's despite Seven trying to help them. Of course, this means that they will not be going to where they need to go to save Beverly. And as Riker and Picard talk about this, Seven of Nine looks on. And of course, Seven is no fool. We have a scene with Raffi, played by Michelle Hurd. Raffi not being one of my favorite characters. And when we first see her, it's not looking very promising. As it seems like she's turned back into her old drug-addicted ways. But this turns out to be a cover for whatever Starfleet intelligence operation that she is running. Admittedly, these scenes held very little interest for me. 
though I am told that they will pay off eventually. Like I said, I am not a big Rappy fan. Picard and Riker are not sleeping in their quarters. Quarters that resemble something that you might see a first-year cadet having to deal with. Not fit for a former admiral or a captain. Apparently, it has been 20 years since Picard and Beverly last saw each other. In fact, it's been 20 years since she talked to anybody. And they speculate about what could possibly have caused her to cut off contact with everybody. And that 20-year figure seems to be around the time of Star Trek Nemesis, when last we saw these characters on the big screen. They get a call from Seven to meet at the Observation Lounge, and Seven, once they arrive, says, hey look, you're going to tell me what the hell is going on or I'm going to toss you out the nearest airlock. And Riker's like, that's how you talk to an admiral? And Seven's like, no, that's how I talk to a friend. And I found that, I, I really enjoyed that line. I thought it was a very good one. Apparently, Annika, Seven of Nine, is uncomfortable with her career and isn't so sure that she is in the right place as both Picard and Janeway have suggested that she rejoin Starfleet. And while there's a lot of things about the last couple of seasons that have not been great in Star Trek Picard, Jerry Ryan was not one of them. She has been phenomenal through all three seasons of this show, or at least two seasons plus one episode. Picard reveals the true reason for their presence there, and that is to rescue their friend Beverly, who Seven is very much aware of. As it turns out, Seven has already disobeyed orders and brought them to the sector they wanted to go. Shaw wakes up and realizes that they are not where they are supposed to be, and goes to the bridge and realizes that Seven disobeyed orders and says that loyalty just cost her her career. Meanwhile, Picard and Riker are already on a shuttle. And I gotta say that Frakes and Stewart together is fun to watch. Frakes is not the greatest actor ever, but he has charm to spare, and watching him play off Stuart is just a lot of fun. They find Beverly's ship and board it, and for the most part, things seem pretty quiet. The recording of music that we heard at the beginning of the episode was recordings that Picard made for Beverly back in the day, instead of flowers and candy. Picard eventually finds Beverly in stasis because she was not doing very well last we saw her. And Riker ends up having a phaser pointed at his head. Eventually, Picard talks this guy down. And this guy turns out to be Beverly's son, which we, which, which we find out here. Which, you know, he looks about 20 years old. I think he very well could be Picard's son. And I hope that's the case. Despite that being cliched, repeating beats from previous movies, I really don't care. Rafi, meanwhile, ends up finding ends up realizing what's going on. There's about to be an attack somewhere. Looks like to be, I don't know, some kind of Starfleet installation of some kind. I thought it was like maybe not quite Starfleet Academy, but some kind of school connected to it. And she gets there too late because the building is destroyed in pretty dramatic fashion. Picard, Riker, and Beverly's son soon find that they've been discovered by whoever was chasing Beverly. And the ship is huge compared to the ship that they're on. Who will this be? We don't know. How will the Titan figure into the plot from here on out? Not sure. What's going on here? I have absolutely no idea. And we will find out next week. As far as this episode goes, it was a very good episode. The tension was good. A lot of beautiful visuals. The acting from Stuart and Frakes playing off each other was a lot of fun. And it was good to see Seven interacting with Picard again. And I very much look forward to seeing what the rest of the season holds. If you like this video and want to support the channel, there are a number of ways to do so. You can follow me on Twitter at Corn Productions. You can join my Corn Productions Facebook page. You can buy something from the Corn Productions store on Zazzle. You can buy me a copy, which is a new way to support content creators such as myself. And of course, you can like, share, and comment on this video, as well as subscribing to my channel. This is Dave from Corn Productions, signing off.